Happy birthday, Second Baptist Church of Detroit, 185 years of faithful service and dedication to the Lord. What a blessing. It is by only through the grace of God that we go forth. And today's message is about how we bring our future to our present. The cutting edge, reflecting on 2 Kings 6, 1 through 7. When an ax head falls into the water during a building expansion project for Elisha's students. This message is gonna look at how do we keep, maintain, regain our cutting edge and how do we bring our future into the present. This is our sermon for our 185th church anniversary. And I pray that it is encouraging to you. God bless you, Second Baptist Church of Detroit. God bless you, our dear friends, family, and visitors. We look forward to your positive feedback. I am so grateful for this blessed opportunity for us as a church to celebrate 185 years. I'm glad to stand here as this congregation's 24th pastor. And um, of this in this church's history. I thank God for the previous pastors who faithfully served this work. 185 years of committed service for this church's, from this church's pastors, offices, and members. Wonderful members like the ones that we were able to honor today in the service award, uh, like Dr. Sister Dr. Barbara Williams, like Deacon Jordan. Deacon Jordan, in fact, um, gave me marching orders uh, early on before I had even moved here um, to Detroit. And I thank God for both of them and their precious souls and the wonderful examples that they have given to us today. The text for today is from 2 Kings 6, verses 1 through 7. That reads, now the company of prophets said to Elisha, as you see the place where we live under your chain charge is too small for us. Let us go to Jordan. Let us collect logs there, one for each of us, and build a place there for us to live. He answered, do so. Then one of them said, please come with your servants. And he answered, I will. So he went with them. When they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was cutting a log, his axe head fell into the water. He cried out, alas, master, it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, he stuck a stick, stuck, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron flow. He said, pick it up. So he reached out his hand and took it. Anything that is fresh, insightful, and progressive will have moments where it can become dull. After receiving both of my vaccines, one of the first things I did was go to get a haircut. Glory, hallelujah. <laughs> One thing you should always look for when you visit a barber, this is a new barber for me, new town, new barber. One thing you should always look for is if the barber changes the razor blade from customer to customer. If you ever see someone not change their razor blade, don't walk out of there. Run. Never come back. They do this for sanitary reasons. You don't want to leave the barbershop with more than just a haircut. Back in the day, they had one permanent straight edge that they used on everyone. And between clients, they would use a leather strap and sharpen it. It would clean it a bit. Then they would dip it in germicide or alcohol 
I find it interesting how after every client, they would resharpen their blades. See, now they just put a brand new blade in it. But back when they were using the same blade, before the disposables were so popular, they would have one straight edge and they would sharpen it after every single client. Same goes for chefs. During my early college years, I worked on a cruise ship, went out of school to make extra money. And I remember how the crew chefs would sharpen their knives on a regular basis. Every day, you would see them sharpening their knives before they started their day. And sometimes in between shifts, they would sharpen their knives again and again. See, when you are relevant, you must actively work to keep yourself sharp or you will lose your cutting edge. Second Baptist, we must be on the cutting edge if we're going to bring our future to our present. The deacons asked me to consider this text for this year's 185th church anniversary. It is a bit of an obscure text from 2 Kings 6, 1 through 7, but in it, there is a big meaning. Let's deal with some background. So what we have here is the prophet Elijah, who made quite a name for himself. And by the time we reached this text, he had healed Naaman of his leprosy, and he caused the defeat of the Syrian rival army by blinding the entire army so that the people of God could win that battle. So this got around. Surely these events got around and garnered Elijah a lot of attention, so much attention that many young folks came to him, wanted to learn from him. They were called the sons or the students of the prophet because he had a school for ministry. We find in this text that they had outgrown their dwelling place, which we should think of as a school or like a boarding school for ministry. And when they had outgrown the place, they decided it was time to commit to an expansion project. Because see, when you're on the cutting edge, you must expand. God is expansive. So God's people are expansive. You cannot stay small. We cannot stay small. No, the text tells us, it says, now the company of prophets said to Elisha, as we see, as you see, the place where we live under your charge is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan. Let us collect logs there, one for each of us, and build a place there for us to live. So the place that they were at was too small, so they knew they had to go somewhere else. You cannot stay small if you're trying to grow. You cannot be revitalized if you're trying to stay small. You've got to go away from small thinking. You've got to go away from being small spirited. You've got to go away from even being small in number. We cannot be small minded. What's it mean to be small minded? What's it look like? We're small minded when we are afraid of the vision that God has given us. You're small minded when you're running from the vision when you are afraid of it, you are small-minded. When you are afraid, you're scared to dream of tomorrow. You are small-minded when you have restricted your imagination. You put chains and fences and borders around your imagination. We cannot be small-spirited. What are the symptoms of being small-spirited? I don't know about some of you all, but every once in a while, something may be going on with me. And I'll get online, I'll look on a web, WebMD, try to find out what is this symbol, what's going on. And uh, that's kind of dangerous to do because WebMD can make you think that, you know, the whole world's collapsing around you. So you kind of got to be careful with that. But what are the symptoms of being small in spirit, small in spirit? The symptom, one of the symptoms of being petty. Petty, petty, pettiness. Can't let nothing go. Big, big mountains out of small molehills. Petty. A, a symptom of small spiritedness is being unforgiven. You can't forgive. Can't forgive, folks. Can't let stuff go. Holding stuff, holding grudges for so long, you forget what you were mad about, but you remember you don't like the person. Small spirit. Small spirit is being selfish. This is my sandbox. You can't play in my sandbox. Find your own sandbox. Go get lost. Big old sandbox. Can't nobody else get in your big sandbox. You don't need all that sandbox. Selfishness. Suspicious of everybody. 
of everyone, small spirit, holding grudges. These are the symptoms of being small spirited. And if you are to be on the cutting edge, you cannot be small. You cannot be small minded, you cannot be small spirited, but also you cannot remain small in number. We must grow in the faith, yes. We must grow in maturity, yes. We must grow even in number. The Great Commission tells us to make disciples. To make disciples, it's a constant mandate. We always should be about the business of making disciples, not through religious imperialism, but through religious compassion, service, and love. When you want to grow, you must build. They're going out to build. They have got to grow, so they're going out to build. It required their labor. These young folks, they said, they said we're going to learn from the prophet because we want visionary leadership. They wanted to have constructive dreams. They wanted to have a fruitful imagination. You must seek these things. The young men in this text knew that they had to seek these things from the prophet Elisha. We all must build. Verse 3 says, then one of them said, please come with your servants. He answered, I will. So he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. Now, know, church, that before you build, you must cut. Before they could do their building expansion project, they had to cut down some things. We must cut down some things, too, if we're going to build. We need to bring some things with us as well if we're going to build. Now, on Wednesday night's call, we made a long list of things that we want to take with us into the future and things that we need to leave behind. And if we're going to build, we got to be intentional about leaving some things behind and about packing our bags and taking some things with us to where we want to go. Please know that they were building a school. They were building a place to educate students in the faith so that they can go and teach God's message. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know that all of us, we all must work. Whether you like it or not, every belief on some level is a teacher. God gives us all, every one of us, everyone who's watching, every one of us here today, God gives us all a sphere of influence. No matter how young you are, no matter how old you are, you have a sphere of influence. People who listen to you, maybe even look up to you. People who appreciate what you've got to say. And those people God has put into your care. And we must build them up in the spirit. Build them up toward Christ. How is my behavior in front of them? How is my speech? Am I a walking billboard for my church home? The best preacher in your sphere of influence is your Christian witness. You can introduce me to them all day. Introduce me to them. I, I love to meet them. But if you're not living your life right, they're going to say, what kind of pastor is he that this person going to that church and this person look like this? <laughs> Every last one of us we are a teacher in our sphere of influence. You are the preacher in your sphere of influence. What are you teaching people about Christ? What are you advertising about your church home based on how you live your life? Just like all these students, they came together to build this school. All church members, all of them, everybody must come together to rebuild this church. Everyone, young and old, people with degrees, people with no degrees, people who live near, people who live far. Every one of us must come together to rebuild this work if we want to leave a legacy. It says in verse 5, it says, But as one was cutting a log, an axe head fell into the water, he cried out, Alas, master, it was borrowed. A couple of things I want us to reflect on with this verse is that. Uh, uh, an axe just doesn't, an axe 
an axe head just doesn't, it just doesn't fall off. Okay? It just doesn't fall off. He, he had to be chopping for a while and saw loose and kept chopping. He had to be chopping for a while and saw something was wrong and kept going. He had to have neglected a, he had to neglect a little bit his axe head for it to fall off. And then it finally falls off into the water because of his neglect. It was poor stewardship of what he had been blessed with. We got to be good stewards of what God has blessed us with. God, God didn't just give us 185 years to flex. God didn't give us 185 years just to brag to folks. God gave us this blessing so that we can be good stewards over it. God don't want this church to die. God wants it to live. We cannot neglect our access. When it falls into the water, what does he say? He says, the last master, it was borrowed. <laughs> well, sisters, many, many folks are living on a borrowed legacy. And we must create our own. We borrow the legacy of our parents. We can borrow the legacy of our predecessors. But we must live our own life. We must create our own legacy. How will folks look back at history? What would they say about us? Yeah. What will be our legacy? Historic churches must realize this. We cannot expect credit for the legacy of yesterday. We must earn our own right. Brothers and sisters, he, he panicked. This access to the water. He said, alas, master is born. He, he panicked. Why did he panic? Many of us have seen the movie The Black Panther. A cultural sensational movie. Black Panther was a movie that many people were very proud of. Now, Black, if you've seen Black Panther, you know that in Black Panther, the reason why Wakanda, Wakanda, well, the reason why Wakanda was so uh, powerful was because they had something in it called vibranium. Now, vibranium and Wakanda has really already existed in the place of Kemet that we now call Egypt. What made Kemet so strong and so powerful? It was iron. Iron, the use of iron. Iron was very, very valuable. Iron was very valuable. It made armies strong. It made building projects bigger and better. Iron was Value. Iron made Kemet into a mighty empire. Now we think about iron today, you know, whatever. But back then, this tool was very expensive. It was very, very valuable. This person cried out, I've lost something borrowed. It had value. Your edge is value. And if you lose it, it's worth regaining. You all remember in Black Panther when the vibranium was stolen? They were willing to go to the ends of the earth to find that vibranium and bring it back to Wakanda because your edge is valuable. When you drop your valuable edge in the water, don't just forget about it. Don't just leave it there. Don't just turn your back on it. You've got to get it. Don't say, well, we had an edge 40 years ago. We had an edge 80 years ago. But at some point, we dropped it in the water and moved on. Don't say that. You've got to get your edge. In the book, Unstuck Church, the author discusses seven stages of church life. They talk about the launch, momentum growth, strategic growth, sustained health, maintenance, preservation, and life support. Other authors have simplified this list and have put church, and church life into three stages, growth, maintenance, and dying. Growth, maintenance, and dying. Now, I'm going to say this. 
I know, I know some people who were on life support and came up out of it. Just because you're on deathbed doesn't mean you have to die. You just got to find your edge and kick back into high gear. Just because you're on life support doesn't mean that you have got to die. You just got to find your edge and put yourself back into a growth stage again. But you must find your edge. Verse 6 says, Then the man of God said, Where did it fall? When he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. He said, Pick it up. So he reached out his hand and took it. I want you to take a note that they went to God's man. They went to God's person to find their edge. In other words, you will not get your edge back without God's anointing. When God sends you a teacher, a leader, and people rebel against the one God has sent, their axe will stay in the water. And they'll never find their edge, and they'll never grow again. You, you cannot rebel against who God has sent you to help you to get your edge out of the water. Now, with this iron floating to the top, this don't happen. Iron doesn't float. What happened here was uncanny. What happened here was unconventional. What happened here was unique to their experience. Iron doesn't float. But you've got to understand, church, you've got to understand that if you're going to grow and see another 100 years, you're going to see some things that might seem unusual to you. You're going to see some things that might be unique to your experience. You must see some things that might be unconventional to you. But when you see it, remember that iron doesn't float. But iron going to float today because God is doing something new with you. And God wants you to get your edge back. Verse 6 says, Then the man of God said, Where did it fall? And when he showed the place, he cut off the stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. He said, Pick it up. So he reached out his hand and he took it. Brothers and sisters, I, I just want to share this with you. You got to reach out your hand in front of you to take it. He said, Reach out your hand and get the axe. Get this ball together. Reach out your hand and get it. You got to reach out your hand. You got to do something. Reach out your hand to grab it. Ain't just going to come to you. Reach out your hand to grab it. Brothers and sisters, you will not get your cutting edge back by reaching behind. You're not going to get it. You're not going to get it by reaching behind. You're not going to get it. Brothers and sisters, you're not going to get it by reaching side to side. It's just not going to work. That's not going to work. You're not going to get it by reaching side to side. You're not going to get it by reaching behind. You're not going to get it by reaching side to side. Brothers and sisters, if you want your edge back, you got to get it by reaching ahead. We aren't going to go back to the past. The past ain't coming back. We are not staying in the present. Every minute that goes by is a minute that's in the past. We aren't going to get it by simply waiting for our future to come to us. No. We're going to bring our future to us today by being on the cutting edge and bringing our future to our present. Yeah. Yeah. Now, seconds, history suggests that our forebears did not just come to church on Sunday morning and disappear for another seven days. No, they were involved. They were working for the Lord all the time. And second has a long history of being on the cutting edge of ministry. From 1836 to 1865, the church served as the station on the Underground Railroad, receiving some 5,000 slaves before sending them on to Canada by giving them food, clothing, and shelter the church was in total defiance of the nation's fugitive slave laws. That was cutting edge. In 1839, Second Baptist established the city's first school for black children 
and, and in 1870, a member, Fannie Richards, became the first black career public school teacher in Detroit. That was cutting edge. In 1843, the first state convention of colored citizens met at Second Baptist, demanding the right to vote. The Equal Rights League made second petition uh, in 1865. Both were denied. The church persisted until the end of the Civil War when the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were added to the Constitution, declaring an end to slavery, making black citizens uh, making black citizens and allowing black men to vote. That was cutting edge. In 1859, abolitionist Frederick Douglass spoke at Second Baptist minutes before a meeting in the Detroit home of revolutionary John Brown to plan methods of freeing slaves. That was cutting edge. I don't want our cutting edge to be only in the past. We must be the cutting edge today. For Barrett, there's so much, so many things. But we've got to be the cutting edge today. Because people are still suffering in the world. There's still work to do. Poverty is still rampant. Hunger is still rampant. Voting rights are still under attack. Prisons are still disproportionately full of non-white people. Black folks still have a low medium wealth. We have been surpassed by other groups who have been who are newer to this country than us. The education system still needs to be supplemented with cultural enrichment. Brothers and sisters, there's still work to do. There is still work to do. We must still be on the cutting edge. Brothers and sisters, people are still lost. Wandering, desperate for connection with God, desperate for connection with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. People are still lost. We must still seek and save the lost. We must still proclaim the message of the gospel to the desperate, the destitute, and the dispossessed. This city needs the message of Christ. This world needs the message of Christ. Today, brothers and sisters, we remember those church sisters in our 185-year-old history who went to everyone they knew and told them that Second Baptist is a place where you can be welcome and you can be loved. We praise God for every one of those sisters who made this church a home, who made it a community and not just an institution. We thank God for them. We thank God for those church brothers who went and witnessed the message of Christ to their co-workers on assembly lines and factories and the plants who served diligently and honorably in and out of the church building. We thank God for those brothers and sisters in this 185-year-old history. My dear friend, we thank God for these brothers and sisters who brought back with them hundreds and hundreds of precious souls to this community. That is cutting edge. It's time we get our edge back. That's the cutting edge. The cutting edge is a church that puts community before business. The cutting edge is a church that puts ministry before bureaucracy. The cutting edge is a place where law comes before grudges. The cutting edge is a place where faithfulness comes before self-interest. The cutting edge is a place where mercy comes before bickering. Yes. The cutting edge is a place where the benefit of the doubt comes over condemnation. The cutting edge is a place where restoration comes before destruction. Yes. The cutting edge is a place where compassion is there before judgment. Mm. The cutting edge. When you are on the cutting edge, you are building. We are creating a legacy for tomorrow. And you are bringing your future to the day. It's time to reclaim that cutting edge. And it's on us. It's on us. It's on every last one of you. And myself included. It's on us to make sure that this church lives another 100 years. It's our duty. It's our legacy. It's our mission. God bless you. The doors of the church are open. Come on.